I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of Explosion 4. Got fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Please, now remember given the payday. Has you been accounted for? Okay. 610B, now is the main date. 610B. I'm out uh, here. We got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling. Fire shown from the second floor. Give me a second alarm on this. See up there, top floor. I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke. Go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. Got people on the front fire escape here with windows sensors below them. We need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one story single family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary searches are underway. Hey, everybody, we're back with our podcast, Old School. I'm Rick Lasky, along with my good buddy, Chief John Salka. Um, we've been, um, oh, we just we just finished. Let's do a little update, John. Um, uh, FDIC, um, we, we talked about this a little bit before. Let's talk about it again, uh, is in August. They moved it. We had to move it. There was no way. I mean, as much as Bobby, you know, Bobby and Diane, they've been trying so hard, buddy, you know, just like they have with, with Firehouse to make this happen and with the, with, with the pandemic and it's just, you know, and we just keep asking people to be patient. I know when I posted a new dates, John, a couple of people were like, again, I'm like, you know, yeah. Think about bringing thousands. I mean, normally it's 35,000 for FDIC into a place and, you know, trying to hear to still social distancing and all that, try to make it happen in April. It just, it just wasn't, it just wasn't going to happen. So um, we got an August, August dates now, correct? Yeah, we've got August, so we're we're moving from April to August for our listeners, um, and and it, we shifted. Usually, FDIC, you get there Sunday, and Monday and Tuesday are hands-on training and the hot workshops, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is general sessions, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday is is vendors. Well, so for our for our listeners, all you got to do is slide that week, okay? Is slide that is slide that week from a Monday start to a Thursday start. So Thursday and Friday will be the hands-on training and the workshops. John and I will be doing um, uh, uh, our chief officer uh, training academy, a field training academy for battalion chiefs or shift commanders uh, that first day. I'll be doing a program before that for women in fire. Um, and then, um, uh, so, so again, keep in mind, Thursday, Friday will be your hands-on training and your workshops. Then Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Monday will be the general sessions that they do. That's your Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the old, old setup. And then, you know, exhibits will be actually like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So pretty easy to follow. And what they're doing, folks, is for the majority, as far as I've heard, the vast majority, I won't say if not all, because I'm sure someone's going to have a conflict, a date, you know, a wedding or something with their family, the instructors are all moving. Everybody's just moving. Uh, John and I have the same slots. Um, again, you know, when, when, when we're there, um, we're going to be doing um, uh, Chief Officer's Field Training Program from 1.30 to 5.30 on Thursday. I'll be doing, um, from 11, prior to that, on, on Thursday, from 11 to 12.30, sweating the small stuff, keeping your people safe and alive for the Women in Fire Conference. And then Saturday, we're going to do, it was our, going to be our first time adjusting and kicking off this program last year with the postpone it, postpone it. If you remember guys, John and I used to do with Bobby Halton, issues and challenges of fire service, big room. And uh, years ago we had Bruno and Brennan unplugged. Uh, then we lost Tommy. And then it was uh, Bruno and friends and Bruno and, and our good friend, John Norman. And sadly we lost over the years, you know, Chief Brunacini. So it ended up with, you know, Bill Gustin. So what, what, here, here's the lineup for you. It's going to be, it's going to be, you know, John Norman, Bill Gustin, Bobby Hall and John Salka and myself from 5.30 to 7.15, 7.15 at night. And we're calling it after hours. There's no script. Um, again, that's going to be on Saturday. Um, we'll be in the book boots the whole time. And then Monday, um, Monday, you know, the last day of general sessions, if you will, we're doing our three degrees of May Day uh, from 8.30 to 10.15. So uh, August 19th through the 24th is the conference. All you have to do is go to FDIC.com and have all the information. Uh, we'll be back to April. I talked to Bobby, the boss, and we'll be back to April the following year if everything goes well with right, what right. we're dealing with. But, uh, you know, John, real quick, 
there, there, there just was no way, you know, you, you know, with firehouse with, with Peter trying to make that all happen. I know he's been, and he's rescheduled too, actually till September. So yeah. with the following month, it's going to be a little tight with two big conferences, right? Right. You know, one after the other, I'm not sure how it'll end up, but right now they're scheduled for uh, firehouse expo in Columbus, Ohio, uh, September 14th to the 18th. So we'll, we'll see obviously how COVID goes and all the restrictions and all the travel problems and stuff like that. But, uh, so we get two big conferences scheduled for August and September of this year. Hopefully, hopefully everybody gets to go. You know, so many things have been canceled and postponed in the past year, you know? Oh, I, I hope so. And just, I, I think we're going to get our arms wrapped around this whole pandemic thing and we're going to be moving forward eventually. But uh, I, like I said, I, I can't imagine for Pete or from, you know, for Bobby, the, you know, the stress of trying to, because people love going to firehouse. They love going to FDIC. That's like right. they're once a year. I can't wait to go kind of thing. So, so folks, Firehouse.com will have the information and FDIC.com for either one of those conferences or both. I know a lot of you attend both and uh, we will see you there. And lastly, John, we just finished um, Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, we, we, you know, for our listeners, this was, this was pretty awesome. What it, buddy, we did an eight part leadership session. Actually what they did guys is they took our leadership book, five alarm leadership from the fire ground uh, for the firehouse to the fire ground. And they took two chapters and that's what we did for eight sessions we did evening sessions with their people on, on Zoom. Started out with all of them in the firehouse training room, and then with you know we had to they had to do it from the firehouses and from their their homes because of you know COVID. But John, it really worked. We finished it last night. Eight parts. What a great! I, I had fun with it. You know, I thought it was great. I thought it went well. The audience was good. You know, I, I, as always, you know, a little bit of this uh, this this virtual stuff is is not totally new. Obviously, people have been doing this before, but with the COVID restrictions, people are doing it a lot more. And to a lot of folks uh, on both ends, presenters and, and, and folks that are attending, it's new. And so they were, they were a little cool, you know, the first couple of classes, but they warmed right up. And after a couple of classes, after a couple of sessions with them, uh, you know, we were getting the responses and laughing and, and, you know, questions and stuff like that. So it was, uh, I thought it was a productive, a productive eight sessions. I, th I think they enjoyed it. We got a lot of good comments last night after the final uh, session. And it was a good topic as well. Well, and I got a couple of good emails this morning from people, John, and, and you're right. It is, you know, it, it, it's new, but it's not new. And you and I have been doing the virtual stuff for a long time, but for, for the shift firefighter, the shift officer, a lot of this is new. And like you said, there, you know, sometimes the internet run a little slow. So the responses might be a little, so you have to pause and, you know, but, but it went well. And um, uh, we, we had a good time with it, but uh, so we covered all eight chapters over, eight weeks. And I think the two hour session was nice. It was just about the right time, John, not too long and not too short. So, Perfect. Perfect. Hey, um, you know, we, we did a whole, uh, with this old school uh, podcast, we did a whole like block, like about three or four in a row on search, you know, and, and we did, we did a bunch on, you know, the OV and ventilation. We did, we did ventilation, vertical, horizontal, all the different things, the outside vent person, but we did some know your SCBA, you know, we did some, you know, searching with a partner and different things like we that. We did the so, primary search. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we did that. But, but, you know, one of the things that we got some comments on was uh, from some of our listeners was if we could delve a little bit more into searching above the fire, you know, so, and, 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 uh, uh, you know, and John, you and I have run into people in our teachings and the travels that, well, you know, the whole, search, well, we don't search above the fire unless we could take a line with us and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of, thoughts out there that I think are kind of uh, a little off that need to be readjusted for some folks and things like that. But how, let's just, how about we talk about that? It was a good suggestion from one of our listeners. Could you go a little bit more to search above the fire? Yep. Yep. I, I think it is a good topic. And, and a couple of things, a couple of points you just mentioned just, just a moment ago are very valid. And uh, you know, we're, we're always here to try and make improvements and try and make things better and to try and, you know, help folks get 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 the job done maybe maybe more efficiently maybe a little bit safer maybe more quickly maybe with a better eye towards victim survival um and and i don't want to say it's not all good news but but some there's some things that are going on out there that that aren't necessarily good i mean we're still losing we're still losing almost three thousand people a year in the united states in in fires and most of them, a great majority of them, if you look at the United States Fire Administration and a lot of the other reports that come out, and a lot of them are dying in private dwelling fires in their own homes. It's just, it's just, I don't know, I don't want to call it an epidemic, but 
if 3,000 people were dying every year of something else or of some other cause or some other type of incident, there'd be an uproar over it. And turns out most firefighters don't even know that almost 3,000 Americans die, not this year, not last year, every year. You go back 10 or 15 years, and I don't know how it's going to go forward. But so having made that point, and, and that's not that's not the primary point of today's Well, and John, real quick, we're real quick. Right. Even if you separate out of the 3,000, those that were killed in wildland fires and those maybe in a vehicle fire or whatever, there's a bunch, like you said, that are dying in residences. Structural fires. Yeah, Absolutely. structural fires. So what we want to do is we want to talk about, you know, searching above the fire. And and like Rick just said, there are some departments that are like, well, we generally don't go above the fire until we get a lineup there and stuff like that. And and, and right there, that's a point of contention. You know, I mean, I can tell you right now, I'm not comfortable with that. Now, now I'm a I'm a career New York City firefighter and fire officer. We have a lot of people at fires. We have a lot of, a big a big assignment that goes to fires: three engines, two trucks, and 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 maybe two or three engines and another couple of trucks more when it, when it's a working fire. So so we have a lot of people, and I understand that 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 makes that a lot easier to do. But the question still arises: Don't the folks from your town? Don't the civilians? Don't the inhabitants, don't the citizens of, of where you work or volunteer as a firefighter, don't they deserve, don't they deserve to be found, you know, at a fire? And, well, and we're not just talking tenements and apartment houses here above the fire. We, we, we could be talking one and a half story, two story private dwellings on half acres. They still have a floor above the fire if you have a kitchen fire, you know, at two in the morning. Well, and let me ask you, you know, or, or throw this in there. I think this is where you're going with it too is, uh, and I kind of alluded to it earlier was, you know, you hear from people, well, you don't send someone above the fire, like you said, without a line. And I'm like, well, you're not going to get a whole lot of searching done. You know, I mean, think about, and I, I just seriously, even if you have three people on that, okay, we're going to stretch a line, a charge line upstairs, and then down a hallway, you know, I'm just saying, you know, I, I'm not saying I'm against it. If you can pull it off, I just think it slows down the search, John, it uses a lot of valuable airtime on the floor above. Right. Um, should we be training our firefighters how to search? you know, while the crews are doing battle downstairs, because you're not just, let me get back up. We're not just searching for people. We're searching for fire, fire extension and people at the same time. Right. Right. And, you know, and, and, and like so many of the other things we've talked about, we talked about private dwelling fires. We've talked about the first line. We've talked about, you know, house fires. That's another reason going in the front door is one of the primary locations for the first line for a house fire, no matter where the fire is in a house, you look at a house, no matter where the fire is, my, my personal opinion and backed up by lots of fact and experience is you need to go in the front door and why because once you go in the front door of a private house you pretty much you've secured the main entrance and the main entrance is generally at near or you know across the room from the stairway to the second floor so even if you have a fire you know on this on the second floor somewhere or on the first floor if you go into the same location let's say you have a kitchen fire on the first floor the engine goes in the first the front door and branches off to the kitchen, wherever it may be. And now another team can very quickly and easily go to the second floor. They're still going to be exposed to heat and smoke and, and that and that that flu of, of you know, of toxic, uh, everything going up the stairway, right? But, but they're probably not going to be worried about fire coming up the stairs because the line came in with them, ahead of them or behind them and went to the fire and it's holding the fire to the location where it's at. So you see all these things... This isn't random stuff that people pulling out of a bucket, you know, stretching the first line through the front door to a kitchen and in the back right corner of a house helps secure the stairway. So a team can go up and go to the left on the second floor where there's a known or a possible victim. And they know they don't need a line because the first line is protecting them. So these things all, you know, inter interact with each other. They're all, they're all, they're all helping each other go so, towards the main goal. So mention how important is it? And you and I both know this, but for our, for our listeners, for there to be the coordination, we always talk about a coordinated fire attack, a, a, a coordinated, aggressive fire attack. You know, I, I love that because we've done that forever. A good, solid, coordinated, bang the door, in with a line, in with a search, in, you know, up on top with a vent crew, OV, all that stuff. A good, coordinated, aggressive fire attack. But talk about the coordination, John, of, the, let, let's just talk search about the, let's just, talk, let's just do a two-story single family dwell. Let's make it simple on this one. The coordination between the attack crew and those going above, you know, the, the, the crew on the first floor has to know that they got people going above them in order to know that you're, you're protecting that staircase for them, in order to know that, you know, I'm drawing a line, you know, that whole thing. I used to say, tell my guys either on the radio or, 
you know, you go inside, you skinny down the line, you tap him on the shoulder, tap him, say, hey, you know, you're sitting there where you go, hey, you know, 161, we're, we got the primary on the second floor. And they should turn around and say, okay, we got your back, meaning they won't what? They won't leave you. They won't leave, you know what? They, they won't leave you unprotected. And you now you have the confidence of going up that st- staircase, knowing you got a crew downstairs watching the, you know, not watching it, but making sure that nothing blocks that stairwell for you coming down, you know, whether you have a victim or just getting down that, you know, I just think it gives a certain little oomph in your confidence when you know you got someone, right? Marines, your son, James, having somebody on point, having somebody got your back while you're, well, you know, the cops do it. You go high, I'll go low and we'll do this. And I got you, you know, I just, everybody does it. The military does it. When they go on a bombing mission, they know if there's ground troops there, the ground troops know that there's bombers coming in to help support them. Uh, The same thing with the fire department. We should all be on the same page. It shouldn't be a, an engine crew and a search crew in there and not know that 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 the other one is there. Everybody should know but, that. But it happens. But it happens. Oh, absolutely. And, that, yeah. and that coordinated fire attack. I mean, I've been hearing about the Ford coordinated fire attack lately, like it's something new, like somebody came up with a new title, <laughs> coordinated fire attack. You know, I've been doing coordinated. You've been doing coordinated fire attack for decades. Or any of most organized fire departments have a coordinated fire attack. We know about the outside vent. We know about, you know venting opposite the stream and, and, and all this other stuff. You, you um, and I, you and I have pictures when they first started taking portrait pictures of New York city and Chicago firefighters performing a coordinated fire attack ag- aggressive. Right, right, I mean, they, right. we've been doing it since Ben Franklin started all and, this. And having said that coordinated is not a new idea. It's still a good idea. So if they want to reemphasize it and talk about it again, that's wonderful. Um, but like you just said, whether, whether it's the team that's going in, to go above the fire calls the team that's on the first floor with the fire attack. You know, like I said, ladder one, one to engine two, eight. Go ahead. We're going to the second floor. Okay. 10, four. So now they know, now they both know where they each are and what they're doing. Or maybe you see it's the commander, you know, command the 28 engine. I got a search team going above the fire. Just letting you know, you know, so there's a lot of ways to do it. It's very flexible. You know, there's, it's not a, it's not a strict structure of who notifies who or when they do it, but it needs to be done. Needs to well, be done. And, Everybody needs to be aware of who else is in the building with them. And back to you, was I don't want to skip too quick past. I know we've mentioned it several times, but that's because, folks, it is that important in tactics and strategy when you arrive. And let's say you're the first to engine when you're picking, like John said, the best means, the best avenue into the building. You know, I, I will say this. I'll give it like a 99.9. I mean, there, I, I'm sure there's times you've even said it that you may not, but it almost should be. We always say never say never, never say always. <laughs> Sometimes that front door, like you said, the, I mean, you've got the stairs in front of you almost granted. There's some places the stairs may be some but I mean, almost every house I can think of it's somewhere there. Plus, like you said, you're controlling things. And, and, and we've talked about this before where, if the fire's on the right and the guys at the back yelling at you, no, 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 you can go through, you can go through this door right here, right back here. No, guys, what are you doing? Back, no, you're going through, you know. And so now you drag, you lose all that line on the driveway or the yard going around to the back on the outside. You lose that extra footage of line, okay, you know, length going through the back. And like you've always said, now we've compromised or continue to compromise the stairwell, you know, the staircase where. We have, you know, when we go through the front door, nothing is getting by us. Yeah. You know, not even, the, a, not even just the stairwell. You've compromised the whole rest of the building. Because yeah. now you're coming in from the outside. You're fighting your way into the building. And where you spo- you're supposed to be pushing the fire towards an exit opening, towards a window, towards the door that it's venting out. Instead, you're coming in, and now the rest of the first floor is going to get additional heat and smoke pushed into it, even if there's a search team going left from the front door. When you go right to the fire... Now, if you don't go right to the fire, if you go in from the outside and the search team is in the front door going for a search, now you're, you're probably contaminating their search area that they're trying to go into. So it's, like I said, I, you know, today's topic is not, you know, where the first line goes or something, but I do want to make the point. We do that, want to make the point that critical. it's all coordinated. Yeah, that's critical. If we're, if we're right. going, like we're talking, going to the floor above, we need to know someone's got our ass covered downstairs. And, right. and that means line positioning, you know, and, and whether that's, you know, choice of doors or entrances or so on and so forth. Um, now, oh, here's a great question. Go ahead. So here's a great question. You pull up to this house, two story, two story peak roof private dwelling, occupied on both. You know, in other words, the bedrooms upstairs and whatever downstairs. So we we get there, working fire. First engine pulls a line, and they go to the front door, moving in, looking for and searching for the fire and getting to it. Chief pulls up, 
Now, an, another rig pulls up. It could be an engine, could be a truck. There's some fire departments that don't have trucks, right? They right. just got three or four engines. And Still got to do truck work. Pulls up. Huh? Still got to do truck work. Truck without right. a truck. So, so you got the first engine. They laid a supply line coming in. They got their own line stretched. They're good. They're good to go. They're already in when the second engine gets there. What does the second engine do? What does the second engine do? Whether the chief is there or not. Obviously, if the chief is there, he'll decide. If there's no chief there, then the second engine officer is going to decide. Or maybe... Or maybe a department's tactics are already established, and, and that will that will you know tell you what to do. But let's just say the chief's not there. Second engine rolls up. What do they do? Now, when I'm looking at two o'clock in the morning at a first floor fire in a private dwelling, and I already got a team inside, I already got an engine stretch. A guy's outside at the panel, and the team is inside. Officer and a firefighter stretching in. I'm thinking to myself, what do we do? Stretch a second line, which is what we just talked about recently in another program, or do I send a search team in? Now, if a rig pulls up with three people, if the engineer outside and you got two people to go inside, you're not going to do both. You're going to do one or the other. There's no correct answer. But I can tell you, if you get reports of people or if an indication of the way the house looks and cars in the driveway and it looks like an occupied place, I might send a search team in to go above the fire. You got a, a one room fire in a private dwelling. That that first hand line is going to handle it. But if things go well, that first line is going to get there and knock that fire down. I think it's more important to get a search team up on the second floor of an, an obviously occupied private dwelling at two o'clock in the morning. I think we have life up there versus, no, we stretch a backup line all the time or or whatever. We stretch a second line to the oh, second you floor. Look how delayed you're going to be getting there. You, exactly. You and I have talked about this in, in our company, Austria Academy, when we do our fire ground scenarios class about the three incident, the three incident tactical priorities, right? And the first one is... It is, and it, and it always should be, you know, the initial fire attack, right? It should be stretching a line, attack the fire, get a line, get a line, get a line. We've talked about that. And then the second thing should be some kind of ventilation, whether it's you pop the back door, you take a window in the back to give a little way for it to go away from you or go topside or whatever. And the third one, search. Second lines are important. I understand that. Secondary searches, second means of egress. All those things are important. And I'm not taking anything away from that, but they're called second for a reason. And I agree with you. It's like, you know what? We've always said there's absolutely no arguing getting water to the fire. Get, we've, we've seen firefighters die in buildings where they chose to go in and search before stretching a line, before getting a line. Getting, you know, they, 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 it's the cop leaving his pistol on the front seat going into armed robbery. So we've talked about the importance of that. And then number two going, well, if I second engine pulls up, Someone's got to open up this building for us to give the victims a better chance for survival, get that to lift off them, give us better visibility, make the environment more tenable and, and, and help us, you know, be able to push further. And then that third crew, cause right on the hand line, we're going in and along the hand line, which is going to be hallways. We're, we're, you know, we're not just bumbling around there. I'm feeling around a little bit. We're pushing a line. We're probably going to, we could crawl over somebody, whatever. And then we're going to get someone in the search. But I agree with you, John. Sometimes some people just, they're so hung up on, they got to get a second line. I got to, because that's what they learn right. in the class. Right. And they, right. and I'm like, I'm not saying don't stretch a second line. I'm not, we're not saying that. Well, listen, you but know what? Prioritize it. There are particular situations I call that, that mandate a second line immediately. You pull up and you got that first floor fire going. And you do your quick 360 or whatever, you look at you look around, you got fire out one or two windows of that room that's on fire that the right. first line's heading for. And but it's burning up the side of this wood siding and it's up under the eve on the second floor, maybe getting it to the second floor window. You may say, oh, hold on a second, guys. Let, let's get a second, let's get a second line up to the to the floor above right now. We can do a little search while we're up there, but we need a line because we got fire going up into the second floor. But if, but if you just got fire coming out one window, or maybe no fire out a window, maybe just the place is chugging, but you know you got a fire in the kitchen. Yeah. No reason to start stretching a line if you're going to conduct a primary search. If you're going to go up at a house fire where there's a one-room job going, if you're going to go to the second floor to start a search, by all means, you want to get up there as soon as possible. And as soon as possible, once you start pulling a line, as soon as possible goes down the drain. You're not getting there as soon as possible anymore. Now you're, now you're, you're cumbersome. Now you got this line, right. you're dragging it, you're pulling it up the steps in the front door. You want to get to, if you're going to the second floor for a search, if you're the first unit, arriving that's going to search first line is already stretched second job at this fire now is to search you need to get your tools get your scba on and get into that house and get up to the second floor that's that's what getting up you know searching the floor above means it means getting up there quick not hopping around with a hose line absolutely not right and exactly and what and and, and and mentioning this when you're up there you know with knowing that you're up to a line your 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 awareness to, to your surroundings, heat conditions, 
you know, I'm talking, I'm talking, John, controlling doors. We've, we've talked about before I go search a room, we're done. I'm closing, you know, closing doors, get, give me as much protection as I can. If I'm done with a room, boom, close the door behind me and that one's done and we keep moving down the hallway or whatever, so on and so forth. But monitoring, you know, it's even more important when you're up there crawling around doing your search or using your thermal, hopefully you got a, a thermal imager with you. You're monitoring your conditions to make sure you don't have something pushing up from a knee wall or older balloon frame where it ran up the wall in here or whatever that you don't all of a sudden you're not surprised. Uh oh, we got a room full of fire up here. Let right. me throw this out there real quick, John. Yeah, I don't want to forget this point. Um, I, I always try to, if I can't write them down, we're doing this because to our viewers, we don't ever have a script. <laughs> As you can tell, we don't ever have a script. But, but John, the importance of, all right, you, you're, you're, you're at, you're at, you're chief, you're in this community of South Blooming Grove. I always say great fire department there, right? Guys get in, stretch the line, first floor, you crew go to second floor for a search. You look out the street, you have one person standing at your pump operator, but there's something we need to think about. We're sending the crew to the second floor. And I've said this to my guys, first chance we can, we need to throw a ground ladder to a second floor window, not take the window necessarily. We need to throw, we need, we need, like we do for a roof crew, we try to provide them a second means of egress off the roof. You know, the importance of throwing ladders to the second floor. We, you and I have talked about it, having the RIT team do it, softening the building a little bit. But if you, and I've, I've stressed this with, with my guys in the past, every firefighter and every firefighter and every firefighter driving should be trained on how to do the single firefighter carry and raise of an extension ladder. You know, you should be able to raise a 24 footer with no problem. And we used to train on it. You know, you put it in pump, you're doing your thing. You know, you know you're, you're standing in front of this house. You should be able to do that. If not, another crew should be very be able very rapidly, you know, again just one firefighter should be able to whether you're pumping or it, it could be just somebody that just showed up you know or there was the extra guy in the rig that came around from taking utilities it could be the ov or whatever to throw a ladder set a ladder to a window let's say something happens let's say they lose their water on the first floor or the you know, whatever you know all the problems john right i just think i wanted to mention the importance when you can when you can of throwing a ladder Maybe one the RIT team usually that throws one to the front, one to the rear, but try to get a ladder. So if they get jammed up, you go, all right, where are you at? We're, we're in the back. All right, get to the front bedroom. I got a ladder. It's already there. I got a ladder there. And now all you got to do is roll it down from window to window instead of get it off your rig and run across the lawn and set right. it and raise right. it, right? Obviously, obviously that would be it. You know, even if you pull up with a short crew, right, with three people on a rig or four people on a rig, you pull up. First engine's in stretching. You decide we're gonna. We'll, all right, Billy, we're gonna make a second floor search. All right, Billy, pull a line, and and then maybe one guy can can grab a straight twenty or something, drag it around to the side of the house, throw it up to that second floor window. By the time he gets back around the front, the other the other the other guy in the crew will have the line maybe, you know, off the rig and 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 jumbled up at the front door, and they can both flake it out a little bit, call for water, and go in. That's one thing. The other thing you want to remember is. Everybody's everybody's got the bailout ropes and all that other stuff now too. So lots of firefighters. If your department's got a bailout rope, you got a ladder. It's in your pocket, you know. And if nobody puts a ladder up and you get in trouble and you get to a window on the second floor and nobody else is there yet, guess what? Time to take the old hook and the rope out and bail out the window. And suddenly that training pays off as well, you know. So, you know, and we we didn't even talk about RIT. I mean, a lot of places have the second or the third engine. Generally, the second engine, I think, is a little early. I think it's a little early when you're trying to get initial operations undone to take the second unit that arrives at a working fire and tell them, and you stay outside and watch. Yeah. You know, and I know they do more than that, obviously, but that that's a little tough. So so, so let's talk about, you, you're going to make a search. You're going you're gonna to go to floor above, house fire, first line's in, first floor. Get to the top of the stairs. You can go right to the right of the house or you can go left. Stairway goes straight up. To a T, hits a hallway, and the hallway goes right and left. And the and, fire is on the right side of the building on the first floor. Okay, and that, back up for a second. The difference for our, for, our, for fo folks, for guys guys and gals that are listening, you know, when you make that, when you're going to go do a first floor search of a one story at two in the morning, you know, as you're walking up, you're trying to look and say, okay, that, that's definitely the living room, you know, bay window, the kitchen, you're trying to, you know, if the garage over here, the kitchen's probably here, so that my good guys, my bedrooms are to the right. So you know you're going to go right or you're going to go left. But when you get to a second floor of a residence, you know, unless they have a game room off to the right, we've got bedrooms usually on both sides. So right. that's out right. the window. You have to make a decision, and part of it's going to be based on what you're going through right now. So we, we, we got fire out the right window on the driveway, first floor, back right corner. 
fire out the window. We, we determine it's a kitchen fire. We're even told it's a kitchen fire. And now you're going up, stairway runs straight up from the front door, hits, it, hits the, the top, top step. You're at the second floor landing now, the second floor uh, hallway, and you can only go right or left. Obviously, if you go to the right, you're going to be above the fire. Obviously, if you go to the left, you're on the floor above the fire, but you're not above the fire. You're at the other end of the house. I'd go to the right because the folks on the right, if there are people in the bedrooms above the fire, those people are in the most distress. That's where they're going to have the, the most heat and the most toxic atmosphere. So there's a right and wrong answer here. Go to the right. Go to the area above the fire first if you can. Well, I was thinking you should know where the fire is when you're going above. No right? different than downstairs. We try to get to the fire and search back away from it. Go to the most hazardous part of the building and work your way to the safest. Because like you said, those who are in the in the most harm are, right. are the ones closest to the fire and the you know the smoke, the byproducts, everything be the right. heat, smoke, yep. everything, all that stuff. Someone else is going to have a little bit more time laying in a bedroom on a floor or whatever at the other end of the house, possibly. Exactly. So so if you go up, and again, again, we're trying to keep this simple and trying to keep it what most people are looking at, which could be a two-person team going up there, right? An officer right. and a firefighter or two firefighters. Right. You're going to stay together. You're going to get to the top of the stairs, stay together, make the right together, go down the end of the hallway. Now, when you get down there, obviously, we've taught a million classes on search. Most people that have had search classes know there's a lot of options. You can have one firefighter stay at the door and another one go in the bedroom, make a quick single search. Or you could both go in and go in opposite directions and make a double search and there's obviously advantages and disadvantages. To the well, and, and, and real quick, you know, some of these second floors, now I grant there's big, big homes being built all over the place, but some of these second floors, we're down there, we got two bedrooms. You know, we've always said you can, you can search apart from each other as long as you can still communicate with each other verbally and not necessarily on the radio. You know, when you're in these bedrooms, I can hear you. I mean, I can, you know, I can, I can actually hear you thudding around in the next room for the most part if I'm listening, you know, so we can still we can still communicate and cover, you know, a lot more territory than just wasting some air, right? Absolutely. So you can have a firefighter in the room and a firefighter outside in the hallway, monitoring the conditions and 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 being available for him, and he could guide him back if he has to, or he could even go in and assist him if he needs to, or you could go both go in and make a quick double search and come back. It may go a little bit may go a little bit faster and may not and may not. Uh, or you could even get to a certain point in the hallway. There could be a bedroom on the left and a bedroom on the right, opposite each other, doorways facing each other, right? And a firefighter could go in the front bedroom and a different firefighter could go in the rear bedroom. And you could both search the rooms and you both know where you are. And you both know you're opposite each other when you get back to the door. And if one, if one firefighter calls for assistance, the other one can make his way out of the room to the hallway and into the front to assist him. This is, this is people that are more experienced now. This is people that are well-trained and got some good experience searching. You should be able to search a bedroom in a private dwelling by yourself. Well, and let's, Nobody should have to come in that room with you. Let's back that up for a second. I was just going to go with that. You know, you and I have, have said this for years and years and decades. You know, number one, you, you don't, don't bring a search rope in with you to bedrooms and stuff. Some people, you bring a search rope. I'm like, yeah, you're going to go around beds and toy boxes and, and tables and crap you know, you should be able to find your way around a bedroom without, you know, getting hung up. Also, the other thing is, it, it, you just mentioned it, you know, all right, so maybe you don't have, you have a younger crew experience-wise. All the more reason, you have to leave someone at the door. Don't both go in there. We've seen it. We've done the, one of the last Maydays I had, you know, one of the lessons there with the Captain John Wright that shared with us, great, great guy, um, you know, was, they didn't leave it. Neither one of them stayed at the door. And three times they went in circles trying to get out and couldn't find the door. People go, how's that happen? It happens all the time. So leaving someone at the door, like you said, monitoring conditions, listen to radio every now and then, you know, banging on the floor, John, you know, John, how are you doing? And you're going, I'm good. And I'm giving you two things. I'm giving you a point of reference. And I'm also helping you calm down a little bit. knowing I got your, I got the door. You know, because if we have to, you know, I, I, it's just like seeing a big gigantic lighthouse beacon at the doorway for you of how to get the hell out of there. So, you know, you, abandoning the doorway is just, God, there's so many things that could go wrong unless you're a little bit more experienced. It was you and I up there, or I, I will just say it, a truck crew in Louisville, you know, <laughs> oh God, great. Those guys, you know, they can, that, they, you know, you, the, there's no doubt. John, I got this bedroom. You got that. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. You know, and boom, 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 boom. And they're done. But like you said, if it's a, a couple of newer firefighters, you may want to, all right, I'll, you go in, I'll stay at the door. And I, and then if you can, the next room, I've always said you should switch. You come out. All right, Rick, it's clear. 
We get to the next door. I go in, you stay at the door, you slow your breathing out. You can actually increase your right. search time a right. little bit airwise. So, and, and we're talking about house fires. We're talking about something that everybody has. Right. We're not talking about tenements or high rises. We're talking about house fires. Everybody has house fires. The most rural little volunteer fire department out in Oklahoma, the most urban fire department up, up, up north or down south, everybody's got house fires. So, you know, and, and everybody doesn't have gigantic staffing. So we, we could easily be talking about a two or three person search team in every situation, everybody should be able to, with the exception, as you just said, of these big McMansions, which there are some places that have those, and, and you're going to have to treat them a little bit differently, a little bit more cautiously. But know your building. The typical private dwelling, average size private dwelling, or even the small ones, that we're talking a two-person crew going above the fire in a private dwelling should be able to handle a couple of bedrooms all by themselves, without a second bottle of air, without dramatic, dramatic danger, without dramatic risk, right? This is there's no fire up there. We're talking about going to a, a heated, contaminated atmosphere where people need to be rescued. And we, we should all be able to do that. And if you can't do that, well, by golly, that's what training's for. You know, you, you, you can train all night long you with took live the words fire out of or my live mouth. smoke, you know? You took the words out of my mouth. I'll just say, how, how many times have we said this before? I know we say this a lot, but, you know, you said it before. If you're a company officer and you're not training your firefighters how to stay oriented in a smoke-filled building, a smoke-filled room, you're not doing your job. And, and I say before, you know, and, and I'll, I'll run through this again for our listeners. So I, we pull up at a fire and Chief Salka stand on the street and he says, Rick, get, get, you know, get inside. Give me, a, give me a primary search. And primary searches are down and hard and fast and quick. That's what, we, to be honest, that's why we have secondary searches sometimes because you're going to miss things once in a while on a primary. You can't cut, the goal is to cover every single inch is to get in and get quick if it's a kid's room, that's when you're reaching in toy boxes and closets. If it's adults, are, right? Adults are like dogs. They flee. Kids are like cats. They hide. Keep that in mind. It'll help you. And when you're looking for kids, you usually find them next to each other. Tommy Shrevino taught me a long time ago, Ricky, look, the other one's got to be right there. And sure as you know what, they kind of huddle together. That being said, so Chief Salka asked me to go in and do a search. Everyone out, on, out in front of your building right now where you're at, at home or at the firehouse, all those businesses, the, the, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, all get to use the five what that God gave them, their five senses. So what do you have for sight inside a burning building? Limited there, okay? Number two, what's another one? Well, smell. Well, that's gone if you're masked up. What's another one? Well, taste. Well, that's gone. Uh, hearing's, hearing's probably your best, but that's hindered because your hood and your regulator and everything else, you know, and you got feel, as John would say, with the big bozo gloves. So my question to Chief Salk would be, so you're asking me to crawl to this burning building, a building that's on fire, a building that's under demolition because everything put in to hold it up is leaving via the smoke and flames. Well, little no use for the five senses everybody else gets to use. If I showed up at a construction site like that, they should send me home with a C&I dog and a white cane. That's the, so tell me, John, that training in the basics isn't important. You know, Absolutely. training, and thermal imaging training and how to crawl around on your hands and knees in and out of a building without getting jammed up or lost. And you and I have talked about, we've talked about search in, in a lot of different capacities, a lot of different fires, whether it's a, like you said, large area search, whether it's commercial buildings, whether it's high rise, there's, there's all different search techniques. But but the concept of being in a in an area or in an environment or an atmosphere where you have zero visibility, maybe, maybe uh, high heat conditions, and you have a goal of finding either fire or victims, that, that's a skill you have to develop in the fire service. And, and if you're going to be the fire department, you have to have that skill. You can't just write it off. Well, we, you know, we're just real rural and we, we just got farmhouses and stuff. So we didn't do a lot of searching without a line. I'm, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that. If you're doing it, you're just choosing to do that. Everybody who puts a helmet right. and a coat and rides on a fire engine is physically, emotionally, and mentally able to conduct a, a, a search inside a a burning building. Everybody's able to do that. Whether you choose to do it or not is your own decision. You you can't you can't you know choose not to do that. Nah, we, we choose not to do that. I don't see that as an option. I think anybody who's in a fire department and you're protecting people's lives, it'd be different if you're a if you're a fire company somewhere that protects a, a factory or something like that. You're just protecting stuff. That's one thing. But if you're an actual fire department in a community where people live, you better be ready to you better be ready to risk it. Let's face it. We all talk about the bravest. We all talk about where America's heroes and all this other stuff. Guess what? You better be, you better be ready to risk it once in a while when the situation presents itself. You can't opt out on search. You can't opt. I'd like to make that a bumper sticker. You can't opt out on search. Search is a primary, very important 
tactic in the, in the American fire service. And we tell people all the time, we're coming for you. We're coming. So rather than lie to them, you know, we are, we're coming for you. We're coming to put out your and we fire. We tell them more than we're coming for you. We tell the kids to close the door, yeah. close the door to your bedroom and stay in there. The fire department's coming. You can't tell them to close their door. And then say, and we, but we got to get a hose line before we come up and get you. You, you got to make your mind up whether you want to go in and save well, people or whether you want to put the fire out. And real quick, you know, when we talk about how to train for this, I think you have to break it down in increments. I think the very first thing you need to train on, and this is period the fire service, but especially for search or interior operations is how many times a year do you do, if once a year or so, a radio drill? You know, I've talked about this, a portable radio drill where you have a crew mask up they got together their mask sitting in one room another crew in another room and they have to talk to each other and this is where you're going to find out those that have no lapel mics on their radios are going to get jammed up trying to pull the radio out of their pocket every time they have to talk or you know talk talking through their that re, i just call i'm sorry it's just ridiculous i don't know why you would crawl into a burning building without a lapel mic on your radio i just don't get it and you know you put your radio in your pocket if you're carrying radios in pockets I'm not telling you go listen to another podcast or anything like that, but you know what I'm saying? You're, you're on the wrong channel, man. You're, you're, on, a, you're on the wrong planet right now. You, this stuff's got to be automatic. You got to, you got to be wearing equipment properly so it can be used immediately with hey, the hands free or momentary use of the microphone and stuff like that. I'm not saying anybody's got to go buy the, the big, most automatic SCBA mounted microphones or anything. I know a lot of people just don't have funds for that, but, but if you've got radios, you should have remote mics. The radio should be buried somewhere so you don't have to remove the radio to use it. You can just use the mic. Uh, there have been several fatal fires in the last couple of years that proved that, even in some oh. big fire departments. In the there, Northeast. There's been several that have, have shown it, and people still flaunt, you know, kind of like in your face go, I don't need my, 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 my lapel mic. So number one, doing the radio drills, learning how to communicate through your face piece, whether you have a voice amp or not. And either way, you have to learn how to enunciate. So if, we're, if John and I are searching... I mean, I, we both have deeper voices. And if we don't take time tonight, we're like, what, what, the, what the hell did the Lasky say? Instead of enunciating, you have to t learn how to, I mean, it sounds kind of silly. You have to learn how to talk through a mask and even with your voice amp so the people next to you can hear you. So number one, work on your communications. Number two, work on your thermal imaging, your tick skills. How to use a, th I watch guys bubble around with thermal images like the first time they were held in their hands in a smoke. And I love them. They all check them. In, in this, John, they all check them where they can see. I'm like, so how do you use it when you get into a smoke-filled room? Well, I look at it and they hold it out here and I go, well, what if there's smoke in between here? You know, shouldn't you, shouldn't you put it up? I mean, work on your thermal imaging skills and, and how to use them in a room, you know, where you start, you're checking, you know, your conditions, you're checking down low, you lay at the doorway, whatever you have to do. S work on searching on your hands and knees, crawling around your hands and knees and tools and how to carry John right the axe with the with the head in your hand to nose your head so the stick is like a a a a, 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 a certain you know a blind man stick with the pick away from you and how to how to maneuver and how to talk and how to like you said stay oriented in a room and know where your outside wall is and the doors and windows and and then be able to get someone out okay we haven't even talked about that that's for another show all right we got him out you know I don't know if anybody out there has practiced, aside from dragging a, a hose dummy, a real live victim in pajamas out of a bed and out of a room across carpeting, you know, unless it's a kid, if it's an adult or a decent sized adult, it's not that easy, homie. You know what I'm saying? So, so again, there's, I, and I, I'll go one step further with that. I'm here to tell you that a single adult firefighter, a, a 35 year old fit as a fiddle firefighter, in making a primary search on the second floor of a house, finds a 185 or 195 pound male victim unconscious in a bed. I'm here to tell you that that firefighter probably cannot get in that house, find that victim and remove him fully out of there all by himself. He's probably gonna need some help or he's gonna start running low on air. Well, so there's no straps to grab. There's no air That's a challenging grab. situation. Very challenging situation. Finding, locating, and completely removing a victim from a house fire. We're not talking Stokes. We're not talking any of that. We're not talking SCBA straps like you just said. We're talking somebody who's wearing pajamas or a t-shirt and shorts, you know? The very difficult thing to do. Again, if you're not practicing that, if you're practicing with hose dummies, Guess what? You better hope you better hope your victims are sleeping with a piece of hose around them so you can drag them out. You know? <laughs> with some webbing around them. And that's, that's right. Why said, that's why I said, John, it's so I think it's so important when you train folks 
you have to train in increments. You, it's like when we do our, our, our get out live, save and own training. You can't go to the most difficult obstacle maze trap thing. You need to work your way up to that. Otherwise, same thing. If you're not, if you haven't worked on communications and you're in there doing a search, now that's going to screw, you know, why not you know, learn how to talk first in the radio, learn how to use your tech, learn how to crawl around, learn how to use your tools, learn how to crawl around in some moderate smoke and heat, learn how to crawl around some little more hostile. So learn how to actually drag a civilian out, like you said, John, but you got to, you got to plant these together. If you jump past some of them, I think it just screws up everything and you actually get people frustrated and you can actually lead them to failure. So, right, right. but get, search it above. Searching above the fire is is absolutely another, another thing about the radio communication just came to me that I want to mention is that's why it's good to have standard terminology. That's why it's good to have typical words and phrases that we use on the radio all the time, rather than just picking a mic up and teeing it and just like sort of getting on and saying whatever you want to say, even though you're thinking about it and you and you're trying to say it right. You say it one way, and then when Billy does a search, he says it a different way. And but instead, if you have the regular terminology. You know, battalion one to search team one, search team one, progress. You mean, that means you're asking them what's the progress. You know, front two rooms complete and negative, going into the second two rooms. Everybody should be answering those the exact same way. It shouldn't be like, well, we just finished the front room in the A, B corner, and, and then somebody else says something different when they right. get asked that same right. question. So once you standardize your terminology and your phrases and your questions and your answers for search techniques and for, and for progress of searches, then everybody answers the same way. And when you know what somebody's saying, you know, it's either this or this, it's easier to hear them rather than trying to figure out what words the guy is saying. You know what words he's saying. He's saying front two rooms complete and negative. Even if it's even if it's muffled, front two rooms complete or negative. Even if you didn't hear me say complete and negative, you knew I was saying it, and that fit right into the right into the program. So that's another reason with radio transmissions, if you if you standardize your terminology and your answers, you'll know what you're looking for and it'll, you'll actually hear it better. Well, we got, John, areas where departments are right next door to each other and one calls it the second floor, one calls it division two, one call, I mean, we can't even get the same terminology going, let alone get everybody on the same page. So I'm glad you brought Don't get that me up. into division two, division three. Don't get me into that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I grew up on the second floor of my house. My mom didn't say, Ricky, you get up to division two right now and, and behave. But but anyway, sorry, we're talking searching above the fire. Um, we talked about whether to or not bring a line up there. If, you know, if you have to, you have to. But understand this, it's going to slow your search process. You're going to use more air. You're going to be bumbling around with a lot of things. So train on how to search off of the line away from the crew, I should say. Okay. If you're down on the first floor, we're doing a two-story single family dwelling. Remember, you got people going above you. You got to protect for them. You got to, you know what? You may have to hang in there longer knowing you got people above you. We're telling folks we're coming to get you. We're telling little kids to close their doors. Like John said, just like you would on the first floor, start at the most involved, hostile, heated, crappy ass area of that second floor and work back away from there. You know, I, I'm a big one, John, like I said, about closing doors behind me you know, help reduce fire spread, whatever he, you know, if I did miss someone, it happens. If I didn't miss someone. I might buy him some more time before it gets crappier up there or whatever. Good hand light, train with your thermal imaging, train on communications, train on your staying oriented in that room, you know, your right hand or left hand search, whichever way you decide to go, you know, communicate with each other, learn how to talk through that face piece. Um, but look, we tell them we're coming to get you. You know, we got to get to the second floor. Like John said, you know, I, I love that the bumper sticker. You know, opting out of search is not not a, not not a, not a decision. It's not a choice. Search is not an option. Yeah, exactly. Anything else, buddy? Well, that's about it. I mean, there's plenty more, but we'll cover it another time. I don't want I don't want to overload anybody in you know a little short session like this. But gosh, we just get we just talked about enough stuff right now for a couple of weeks worth of training, if you ask me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, well, there you go. We, we, we were able to cover briefly, you know, some good points, I think, about searching above the fire. Um, you know, if anything, you know, take some of the, the stuff, the bullet points we talked about, jot them down and come up with your own training sessions for, for your department, for your drill night or for your shift day and uh, go out and practice them. I think you need, again, do them in succession. Don't jump past anything because you'll have some problems later. But, hey, buddy, uh, best way for them to get a hold of you. 
Chief John Salka at gmail.com. All right, I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. We appreciate you tuning in again to Old School, uh, where I, I think the motto should be, we always say where fire service tradition lives. It should be without a script because uh, <laughs> <laughs> where fire service tradition lives without a script because we just run with it. We, we right before we queue up, we go, what topic do I talk about? And sometimes we don't even know. We just get out there and start going. So we appreciate you. We appreciate the comments and the, and the compliments. Thank you for joining us. We ask you every time when we end these shows to please keep the men and women and armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. Hang in there with this pandemic. We'll get past this one day. We're, we're proud of you for what you're doing and taking care of the people out there. With that, God bless you. Be safe. And we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.